Good morning, friends. Welcome to Living Hope Church in Menominee, Wisconsin. I'm Pastor Brent Juliet. I'd like to share with you on, on this Sunday morning, May 31st, a message based on uh, God's Word. And we're looking at the chapter of, uh, 12 of the Gospel of Luke, verses 22 through 34, where we read, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this, your word to us, a, a challenge to us from your Son, Jesus Christ. Pray that we might, might hear the word and take it to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Alfred E. Newman spoke for a generation. If that name doesn't ring a bell, he was a, a red-haired, uh, shaggy, red-haired cartoon character in Mad Magazine who was unruffled by all the problems in the world due to the Cold War. His slogan was, what me worry? Meaning, of course, that he didn't. But if you and I are honest with each other, yes, we do. We worry. What is worry? Simple definition is it's to give, give way to anxiety or unease, to allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. Or a more extreme definition, worry refers to the thoughts, images, emotions, and actions of a negative nature in a repetitive, uncontrollable manner that results from a proactive cognitive risk analysis made to avoid or solve anticipated potential threats and their potential consequences. Okay, well, we don't really think about it that much. We just know that we worry. That description sounds like a pathological condition. What is normal worry? I won't say healthy nor worry because it probably isn't, but what is normal worry as we experience it in everyday life? Is it the same thing as concern? Is making plans equivalent to worry? How about just providing life's necessities for yourself and your family? We feel stress in doing what we have to do because someone has to do it and no one else is going to. But are we right in that assumption that it all depends on us? In our text, Jesus points out once again that God provides for the birds. Earlier in this chapter, it was the sparrows. Now it's the ravens. In both cases, Jesus assures you that you, as a human being, are the highest of all creation and much loved by God. You are worth so much more to God than the birds are. God provides food for the birds, and the birds just go pick it up, which seems much like the children of Israel in their wilderness wanderings when they would go out to gather the daily manna that descended from the sky like the morning dew. It was obvious to them that it was not them, but God who was supplying all their needs. Now, in the present day, it may be less obvious to us that all we receive comes from God. But stop and think about it. Someone else plants the seeds. Someone else harvests the crops. This is true for most of us anyway. Someone else processes the food. Someone else transports it. Someone stocks the shelves in the store. And we just go pull it off the shelf and take it home. Pretty much like collecting manna, isn't it? Or maybe it's a little more complicated for you right now with the masks and the gloves or having to order online, and then, and then having to pop the trunk when we arrive at the store for pickup. 
But the point is that taking care of yourself and your family does not depend on you alone. Now, perhaps you can still conclude, okay, it's not me alone, but it's me and the farmer and the grocer, or it's me and my bank account. Remember that your wealth, like your food and clothing, ultimately comes through God's blessing in your life. That being true, why should we worry? Jesus remarks that the birds have no storerooms and barns. And if we compare that to the immediate preceding uh, verses here, which were Jesus' parable about the rich fool that we considered last week, we see that that man's antidote to worry was to provide for all his own needs by storing all his grain in big barns as a hedge against future calamity. He had it made what could go wrong. He thought he was taking charge of the situation that worried him. He was controlling his future. The worry that Jesus speaks to here is not just some normal and prudent level of awareness, caution, and concern, but it's rather concern to the point of excess. It's actually believing that it all depends on us. And with the current national and local health fears we face, they are a valid concern, and it all could very easily become concerned to the point of excess worry, such as Jesus talks about here. I mean, who is in control these days? Is it you and me? Is it the governor? Is it the president? Is it Dr. Fauci? Or could it be the one who loves you more than all the sparrows and ravens in the world? Could it be that he's in control? Now, it should be possible to understand worry by finding its antonym. What is the opposite of worry? Have you ever thought about that? Could the opposite of worry be faith? Faith in God? Well, if that were true, then worry would actually be unbelief, or at least the first cousin of unbelief, if its opposite is faith. So I think the opposite of worry is not faith, but instead let me suggest a better opposite for worry is trust. Let me illustrate this from personal history. When our children were young, they loved going to the city library. And my day off was always Monday, so every Monday I'd take them to the library. We'd hang out for a while, and then we'd check out the maximum number of children's books allowed, which was 15, until we returned the following Monday to return those and, and check out another 15. Well, there came a day when we as parents thought, or maybe it was our oldest son, Aaron, who thought this, but he should be able to walk to the library on his own. It was maybe a half mile walk, um, and it only involved two or three turns at the most. So we gave him good instructions, maybe even drew him a map, I don't remember, uh, and, and instructed him that as soon as he arrived at the library, he should call us to tell us he was safe. Maybe we gave him money for the payphone, if any of you remember what those were. And that way, if he called us when he got there, then we could stop worrying. And of course, I would go then and pick him up in an hour or so. But as our son's journey began and we stood out on our street corner, waving goodbye, watching him go across the busy 17th Avenue, this was in Grand Forks, North Dakota, crossing busy 17th Avenue, and then he took the sidewalk south on 17th Street and we just watched him as he went, and we were filled with worry. Emotionally, it's as if we're saying goodbye to our son and sending him off to war. First, we were worried that he wouldn't find his way, make a mistake, maybe take a wrong turn. And then second, we worried he might intentionally choose to take a detour, just go exploring this brave new world and get lost. And third, we worried that something unforeseen, something bad, beyond our imagination, might happen to him along the way. It was this vague, nameless fear. Here's where worry is the opposite of trust. Those first two kinds of worry uh, in our experience as parents, worry for our son, those first two kinds revealed a lack of trust or a lack of confidence in our young son. And the third worry revealed a lack of trust in God to take care of our son. 
So why do I even remember such a small incident from maybe 25 years ago? I didn't talk to my wife about this, didn't talk to, to Ruth to uh, see if she remembers, but I have no doubt she remembers this event very vividly. Why? It's because of the emotions. They were real. Anxiety and fear that we felt, and that, that stamped the experience on our memories. As I recall that event now, I think, I'm pretty sure, that just to sort of guarantee our son's safety to control things, I may have followed him without his knowing from a distance, just far enough back that he couldn't see me, and following him far enough down the road to see that he made the right turns, just to be sure. And I realize now that I was acting like God, almost usurping God's role because, in truth, the Lord certainly walked with Aaron that day, fully aware of his every step, and the Lord protected our son. My assistance was not needed, and my worry did not help. So yes, worry is a response to fear, and worry is the opposite of trust. Isn't that always true, that worry is our response in life to the things we fear, and that as we worry, it's really the opposite of trust? It often means we're not trusting another person when we worry. It may also mean we're not trusting God when we worry. Jesus said, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Jesus says, I can't add an hour. We might as well say even a minute to my life by worrying. But I think I can. If you're a married couple, you can probably both point to the one of you who does the most worrying and the one who doesn't have to because your spouse takes care of the worrying for you. I think I am that worrier. I subconsciously think my worrying will protect me from things and protect my family from things, and therefore my worrying will indirectly add time to my life that the worrying itself protects me. By considering all the things that could go wrong, I somehow make them less likely to happen. Is that how it works? No. Here's how it works. Actually, the medical truth is constant worrying will not lengthen my life, but it will probably shorten my life. You can Google it. Many studies have found a link between anxiety-prone personality and shortened lifespan. Still, I think, shouldn't uh, a modicum of concern, caution, taking care of yourself, shouldn't that add to your life? Proper exercise, proper diet, looking both ways before crossing the street. All this can be just good stewardship of the physical gift of life God has entrusted to you, which means it's a good thing. But make no mistake about this. Only God knows the hours and minutes of your life. Every hair of your head is numbered, and every second of your life is known by God. We can do everything right along the lines of health and safety, yet our soul is required of us when it is required. Just ask the rich fool. There's a principle Jesus gives us in Luke 12, 23, when he says life is more than food and the body more than clothes. And, and this is a principle I think everyone would agree with, including the rich fool. The question is, and this is where we disagree about this principle, the question is, what's the more that Jesus speaks about? If, it's, if life is more than the basics of food and clothing, if life is more than survival mode, then what is life really about beyond those basic necessities? The rich fool would have said, yes, life is so much more than food and clothing. Life is big barns, filled grain bids, bins. So life is, he would have said, about happiness. Remember that in that parable, this man stated his ultimate goal in life was to eat, drink, and be merry. Happiness. But when Jesus here says life is more than that, he means something else. So what is the more that Jesus alludes to? It's the kingdom. 
Jesus goes on to say, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. If you're a child of God today, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin, the one who has brought you to the Father by faith in him, if that's you, then you have been given the kingdom. Yet, as you continually seek it, the necessities of this life are given to you by your Father in heaven. So what is a life lived continually seeking his kingdom look like? Jesus goes on to describe it, and this is where it gets a little bit uncomfortable. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's describing a life that is so confident in the treasure of your father in the storehouse of blessing your father pours out on your life, that you could indeed sell everything you have amassed in this life and bless others with it. Should you do that? If the Lord leads you to do it. Who am I to question it? Not for me to say. However, I do not believe this is a mandate for all Christians or a law that Jesus is setting up. I do, however, think this is a heart test. It's a test of where your heart is or where your treasure is. How much of our time and focus is spent on maintaining our possessions, protecting our possessions, and worrying about our possessions? There's a man named, named Joseph in the book of Acts chapter 4 who did not build bigger barns. Instead, he gave a significant portion of his wealth that it be used to meet the needs of people in the early church. And this man was then nicknamed by the apostles. They called him Barnabas meaning the son of encouragement. Why is selling everything we have and blessing others with the proceeds such a difficult thought? You do agree that it's a hard idea, don't you? It is hard for us because we tend to look at these possessions as our security. We do not look at our material blessings as our ability to help others, to bless others as God has blessed us in his kingdom, just don't tend to see it that way usually. Worry or trust. It is revealed in how tightly I cling to what's mine in the face of another person's need. So the very challenging question Jesus has laid before us today really is this. Are all my possessions and my assets the source of my security? Do these things form the strong castle that protects me and keeps me from worry? Or do my possessions, wealth, physical and temporal assets form a storehouse of blessing from God that I am able to, in turn, pour out on others? Only one of these two views can be true. Do I live in a material castle that I'm trusting to keep me safe? Or do I trust in God to keep me safe? God who blesses me wonderfully that I may bless others. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this your word to us. Let us wrestle with, with this uh, dichotomy, this very plain division, this picture that Jesus has, has painted for us about our wealth and our attitude toward it. Thank you, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I wish you a wonderful week and offer you this blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God your Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a good week.